everyone, and welcome to Dungeons & Dragons Made Simple. At least that is our goal. Uh, Miss Rita will be joining me, I am Allie Tran, um, and helping to explain and walk you through how to do a simple Dungeons & Dragons campaign with your family. Uh, right now, I am recording this during last week's snow, uh, and right now the cabin fever is really hitting hard, and I'm sure it is with everyone uh, home in our communities. So we are offering, Miss Rita and I, this idea to turn your living rooms one Saturday or Sunday afternoon into different worlds and to kind of help with the cabin fever and the monotony of winter and cold and not being able to go outside and do stuff as much. Um, but one of the things that I feel is intimidating for people to start Dungeons & Dragons or any role-playing game is the amount of freedom and creativity that's involved. There is not a set of rules that are this simple. You roll up, roll the dice, move the pieces, and you have a game. This kind of world-building game requires imagination, and it can look and feel like anything. And that's what Miss Rita and I want to help um, our library friends and families understand. It does not need to be a world of dark caves and dragons and evil elves, unless that's what you want. Um, you'll see in today's uh, example campaign that Miss Rita and I have created a world that's kind of funny um, and make believe and bright and cheerful and and allows for a lot of different kinds of problem solving. And that's what we want to help you guys create. Um, the important thing is to know the family members or friends or kiddos that are playing. What are their interests? Because um, you can have a whole, an entire Dungeons & Dragons or role-playing game played and not have a single battle. If your family doesn't like conflict or doesn't like um, combat. So you can do it with riddles, you can do it with puzzles, you can do... Uh, different things. You can add music. You can do anything you want in an RPG, which is part of the intimidation people feel trying to learn how to play an RPG. Now, Dungeons & Dragons is one of the most famous RPGs out there. And it's been around, I think, since the 80s. And there's books and there's manuals and there's, you know, classes and... and all kinds of races and different abilities and armor classes and all of this. And while that's fun and engaging, it can be a lot to tackle at first. So we are hoping to take some of that world development and boil it down to something simple. Um, the There are a couple of parts to a Dungeons & Dragons um, kind of a campaign, style campaign that you're going to want to make sure that you look at and we'll identify them as we go, but you're going to need characters. You're going to need um, someone to be what's traditionally called the dungeon master, but um, more recently that term is being changed to game master, which I think is more appropriate. So you'll need character playing characters. You'll need a game master. You will need a goal. What is the campaign trying to achieve? Uh, you want to create a war, a world that this campaign will take place in, and you're going to need a map. Um, something visual so people can see how they're going through their world, but you can also um, enact that world in your living room. Get your stuffed animals out, get your bean bags out, um, get your pool noodles out for swords. Make it a complete mayhem in your living room for an afternoon. You'll be fine. Uh, that's what cleanup is afterwards. So enjoy it. Get involved. Do the voices. Have the fun. Create the worlds. And empower the kiddos in, in your world to problem solve, to create the world with you. It's not simply an adult-led process. And um, we'll get more into that. But I really want people to understand that this is a freedom of imagination, an escape, um, engaging with your family maybe in ways you haven't been able to during this pandemic, um, especially if this is not a kind of game that you typically play. So enjoy! <laughs> So in your kit, 
you should have received a fun little black velvety bag. Looks like this. And when you open it up, it's got your seven iconic gamers dice. So let me just go through these real quick. Um, you'll see in the abbreviations on your explanation page, sometimes I refer to things 1D8 or 1D20. What that is, is you're going to roll one dice that's 20-sided. So this is a 20-sided dice, or die appropriately. This would be a 1D8. So this is an 8-sided dice. Again, 1D6, 6-sided die. 1D12, 12-sided. 1D10, and the thing to remember with a 10-sided dice is your 0 gives you your 10. 1D4, this is the pyramid-looking one, and it's the number at the top of the pyramid that you can read. That is the number that you have rolled. And then this is um, a 1D10 as well, but there you see the increments on here are much bigger. I don't use this die very often unless I'm using it as a decision maker. Um, so odd numbers, yes, even no. Uh, you could also say if I have to roll above a 50 or below a 30, you can do any of those kinds of things. But other than that, at this level, this die is not used very often. And remember, if your kiddos are old enough to know that these aren't candy, they are old enough to play. So why do I have seven dice and how do I know how to use them? Well, basically, each of these die has a purpose. And most of the time, except for this 20-sided die, these, these die will pertain to how much damage your weapon can do to an enemy. So for example, if my sword can do a maximum of six points of damage, in this case, I did five points of damage. If my spear can do a maximum of eight points of damage, in this case, I did a glancing blow and only did two points of damage. That makes a lot of sense. So now that we've gone through the dice that are in your kit, you will also see this items from around the home and reference sheet. This is just to have on hand for you to refer to um, but the one thing that is very important is either a stack of coins in different denominations or stacks of pre-cut construction paper. Uh, no bigger than a coin or whatever is easiest for your kiddos to manage. And you're going to stack those up to uh, keep track of health and healing. Uh, stuffed animals as minis are fun. Things to know. All of this is here and it's information that we will cover in the... Um, video as we go but for quick reference while you're playing I am put it all down in a sheet for you the other thing you got were these brightly colored sheets of paper uh, you have one that says fighter you have one that says archer you have one that says magic user and then you have two that say monster um, you should have a double set of these within your uh, kit. So you should have two of everything. Um, the monsters don't have a lot of information on them. That's by design, and I'll explain that later. Uh, the uh, player cards are just to use as reference as you're playing. And the last thing you should have gotten was a very roughly drawn map. Uh, I purposely drew this a little rough so you guys can see you don't need to be um, overly technical about things. Uh, you just need a visual representation of how and where you're going. So you the next thing we need to consider is making sure you understand the abbreviations that we're going to run into and use throughout the game. First one is hit points. Hit points are the same as life or health in the video game world. Um, hit points means how many hits can you take before you are no longer an active part of the game. You have an NPC or non-playing characters. 
These are characters that are typically managed by your game master. They are individuals that you'll run into on your trek. So your it's Mr. Grounds is the barista or Miss Grumpus, the gossip, who comes in and gives us information. Could be someone you meet along the trail trying to sell you something or to knock you off your focus. Non-playing characters controlled by the game master. Then you have playing characters. These are typically, if you're not the game master, you are a PC. These are the active members of your campaign party. All members are playing. While it's not an abbreviation, it's a concept you should know. Range, how many blocks or inches away something is. So if you're throwing a magic missile, you need to be with a range of 20 blocks or 20 inches. Uh, a sword only has a range of one block so or one inch. So that's the concept of range. And finally, just to review, dice. So if you're told to roll a 1d8, that's, a, that's one eight-sided die. If you're told to roll a 1d6, that is one six-sided die. In more advanced games, you could be asked to roll 4d6, so that would be four six-sided dice. And those are all of the abbreviations that you need to be aware of. Okay, so now we're talking hit points. We're getting closer to this game. Um, it is important to know that in the process of this game, you don't need to necessarily roll in advance to get your hit points. If you have an impatient group of young kids who want to get moving, you can wait to roll your hit points when you first come into conflict with somebody with a, a non-playing character. So we have the eight-sided dice. So in order, I'm going to roll for my archer's life. Okay, for my archer's hit points. Oh, my archer's hat, my archer has eight hit points, so he's a strong character. And I'm using a dry erase marker to write um, the hit points down so we can reuse these over and over again. So if you have a dry erase marker, that is ideal. So now I'm gonna roll for my fighter. Ah, he has seven. So I'm gonna write down my seven. Then my life for my magic user. I would recommend if you have older kids, make them the magic user at first. Only five. Because the magic user is a little more involved. If not, just guide your kids through it. It's all good. Um, so what this means is my art, my magic user can get hit five times before uh, she's no longer movement in the game. My fighter can get hit seven times with seven points of damage. And my archer can get hit eight. So that's kind of as simple as it is to roll for hit points. And in this game, we're using the eight-sided die to figure out what your points are. Alrighty, now we start getting into the real nuts and bolts. We're into magic and weapons. But before we can do that, we need to roll for the life of the monster. So the monster has a life of seven. So remember, we mark that down in the heart. And the cool thing about monsters is your kiddos and family members can create a monster with all kinds of different characterizations and abilities. So make sure um, that you spend a little time creating your monster and give it props and its own mini and standing at the end. So this monster here has seven life points. So in order to hit that monster, okay, I will need to use my fighter in this case. 
And you see where it says to hit roll 1d8. So I'm going to use the 8. And in order to uh, attack, my fighter needs to be within one inch or block of the monster. So there's no point in rolling an attack if my fighter isn't closer than that. So I'm going to roll, and I have a glancing blow of 1. So that would bring the monster's life to 7. So again, a fighter, you use the 8-sided dice, and you have to be within 1 inch or 1 block in order to attack. But let's say the archer is attacking. Alrighty. So again, you're rolling a 1d8 die, but the range of the archer's arrow is 20 inches or blocks. So it's a much further range, larger range than the sword fighter. So you can don't have to be as close. Now, if I'm going to roll, I got a two. So I hit with a two. And so that would bring the monster's life from seven to five. Then we'll go to the magic user. Yeah. So with the magic user, sometimes it might be easier for older kiddos to do this because the magic user has a lot of different um, abilities. Okay. Again, cool thing about a magic user is it can heal anybody in the game. Um, at any time. So that's a really important um, skill to have. Uh, to hit, again, you it can do max and 8 uh, points of damage, so you roll the 1d8. And the range for a magic user is unlimited. Um, and a magic user may heal any character by rolling a 1d4. So you would roll this to heal. So if I wanted to heal my fighter, who may be down a few points, I could give them back two hit points. So that's how you do the healing with a 1d4, okay? But remember, monsters cannot be healed. That's not the point of this. A range for the magic user is unlimited. And another thing with this version of, of an RPG that we're playing today is that characters can, may be healed, if you see here, at any time, even if they've reached zero. And there is no time limit on healing fallen characters. And a character who has gotten down to zero, it's just paused or dormant. It took a nap. It's recovering. It's healing. Uh, we're not killing anything uh, in this version of D&D. &D. The next thing a magic user can do is cast the accurate arrow. Um, this lasts one turn. Again, the arrow would have twenty a range of 20 inches or blocks. And this guarantees a direct hit and a max hit to the arrow. So the uh, casting the accurate arrow um, will guarantee that the arrow hits on its next attack. Not necessarily how much damage it has or it creates, but that it does attack. After accurate arrow, a magic user could choose to do magic missile. And the, this, it's like the arrow and requires a two-hit roll. The range, again, 20 inches or blocks. Damage roll is a 1d4. To hit a 1d20, roll 1d20, roll higher than the number of blocks away. If you roll a 20, it's an automatic hit. So... We get the 1d20, and let's say I am four blocks away from my target, from the monster. 
and I roll a 19. So what that means is that I can then, my magic missile will hit, and then I, I have to roll the 1d4 to see how much damage, try that again, how much damage I cause, and I cause four points of damage. And then the last thing the uh, magic user can do is conjuring a fireball. Range, again, 20 inches or blocks. Damage is with the 1d4. And to hit, you have to roll the 1d20. Higher than the number of blocks away. And if you roll a 20, you get a direct hit. So I'm going to say I am 12 blocks away from my target and I roll a 15 whoo that was close so then I roll my 4d and I got a three so I did three points of damage with my fireball and this is where you can really act things out the players characters get up and they throw things and they can really get into the attack and play that out and have a lot of fun with that or you can play it out with the miniatures and, and do that. Um, we'll show you that when we go through the actual playing. But that's a general idea of how you use magic and weapons. So now we're starting with moving and maps. So as you can see here, this is my ever so detailed drawn map. And we will be talking about how you move through this, okay? So, on your player cards, I'll start with our fighter again. Um, to move, you see, roll a 1d4. So, Willem's going to move kind of slow. And remember, he has to be within a one square range of his target. So, let's say we're at Moonbucks. And we need to get to the stables to collect our stuff, okay? So I'm going to roll. And I rolled a two. So I'm going to leave moon bucks, and I get to go two spots. Now at this point, because we're at the beginning of the game, the game master could say that you're just automatically traveling to the stables. That's okay for a travel like this. I would not do it on these paths coming up, but that's the game master's discretion. So again, Gwillem rolls again, he rolls a four, so. Okay, so Gwillem is currently, I'm gonna put a G here, okay. You'll see right there where Gwilym is. Now Equestra is going to roll. Now Equestra is a my magic user. And she, to move, gets to roll a 1d6. So she's actually a quicker moving creature or character. But not in this case. She moved once. Okay. So that's how that would work. Now... I will, at this point, say that we have all moved to the stables. Okay, we are there. We're getting ready to embark on our way. To we roam. She gets a four, so she would go one, two, three, four. And that's where Equestra would be. Um, and during this time, when we're moving through the map, um, the Game Master can start telling backstories um, or... The two characters could fill that, that movement time with planning, or in this case, because Gwellum the tone deaf is a bard, um, she could be singing and discussing things with Equestra, and they could be having fun and telling jokes. Jokes are, are a good way to kind of uh, uh, make time pass, but the game master can kind of dictate some of that. Um, I would say something like, uh, since 
Equestra rolled higher, be like, Equestra's getting impatient because she keeps moving ahead and Gwellum will not keep up. And Gwellum can then, they can kind of play this out and Gwellum would be like, Equestra, wait up! I'm trying to sing and you're moving too fast! But that's the basics of moving. Um, monsters tend to not really move unless the game master wants them to. So if you are up here with uh, Sir Anchovy later on and you need him to move around a bit, that would be the game master who dictates, dictates that and he can roll for movement if he chooses to or she chooses to. Hi, I'm Equestra. I'm a fairy. I'm also the keeper of the unicorns. So, just the other day, I was hanging out at Moonbucks with my dear friend, Gwillem, the tone deaf. Don't ask her to sing for you, because you won't like it. But, anyway, we were there at Moonbucks. Gwillem is a forest-dwelling bard. Hello, everyone. My name is Gwellum. I am the forest dwelling bard that Equestria insists on calling tone deaf. I don't get it. However, she has a right to her opinion and that is fine, but that will not stop me from singing my beautiful songs and playing my handmade flute. That being said, we have an important mission today. Equestria and I go way back. We have rescued many magical creatures we have made a life of taking care of unicorns and ensuring their their uh, protection as well as I provide musical entertainment for the village despite what Equestria says. So this is kind of where you meet us. We have decided we're going to retire from the uh, rescuing business and just focus on our lovely unicorns. Um, and, you know, things just kind of don't always end up the way you want them to. But I still don't get why she thinks I can't sing. I mean, come on, I'm a bard. I am a forest-dwelling bard. Singing and music is what I do. Who let the unicorns out? Who, 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 who let the unicorns out? <laughs> see, I don't see what the problem is. Don't you agree? <laughs> So as Equestria was telling you earlier, she and I hang out at Moonbucks all the time. It's a little crazy and a little worrisome how much we're there. But uh, she started telling you our story and we were hanging out at Moonbucks doing our thing, drinking our coffee, when we get rudely interrupted. And that's where Equestria will pick up the story. She's a much better storyteller than I am. You'll have a lot more fun listening to her tell it. Cause... And Grumpus the village gossip comes bustling in. Did you hear? He's finally gone too far. Sir Anchovies will lose his knighthood over this. And Mr. Grounds, behind the coffee bar, says, What well, about time? What'd he do now? He's locked all the unicorns in a magic paddock and is invisible. Grumpness flops dramatically in the closest chair with melodramatic despair. Equestra, how could you let this happen? You're the caretaker, aren't you? Like it's my fault. Really. Gwillem slammed down her almond milk, extra foam, no sugar, extra cinnamon chai latte, and she slapped me on the wings, exclaiming, We got this! I know we said we'd retire, but it's for the unicorns. Without them... Our realm will not exist. They hold magic in their freedom and spirit. Being locked away will only diminish the magic and creativity of our world. <sighs> so, I finished my coconut double shot three square extra foam vanilla cold brew and said, well, put it on our tab, Mr. Grounds. We have unicorns to save. If he thinks he's getting away with my unicorns. So Gwillem and I went back to the stables to gather supplies, masks, and a map. We need to decide if we are heading to Sir Anchovies by way of the Saucy River. Either way, much of our time will be spent in Sir Anchovies' land. 
so we need to be careful. As you can see, I'm feeling a little dizzy because now I have to introduce the table to the rules of the game. And that can be overwhelming for some people. This is where people want to get caught up in detail and minutia that really doesn't matter. The important thing here, as is the theme with this video, keep it simple. So, I sit down at the table with a table full of new players, ranging from the ages of 7, you know, maybe even 4 or 5 to 50. And I'll say, alright, the important thing for today is to have fun. We will be loud, we will laugh, we will have fun, we will be energetic, we'll jump off the furniture, we'll do whatever it takes to make this world come to life. That is the rules of the game. There's a few things we can't do. We don't want to argue with each other, we're not going to be mean to each other, and we are not going to constantly fight over decisions. But we will always have fun. We will do the voices, we will act the silly, we will crack the jokes, we will have the fun, we will sing the songs, we will do whatever it takes to make this world and this campaign come to life. Now let's begin. Rules are that simple. No need for the crazy. So right now I have set up the world of minis on a day bed we have in our game room. And let me introduce you to our minis. This is a Questra's mini. So I will be moving the unicorn cat through uh, our world. This little guy is Gwellum, the bard. So he will be moving, or she will be moving through the world that way. And this is our archer that we will pick up along the way. And this is a non-playing character, an NPC. This is going to be Miss Grumpus. As she comes running into um, Moonbucks, complaining about Sir Anchovy. This will be the Mushroom Forest. And the panda over here will be the dump trucks that uh, we have to figure out what to do with. And then this, as you can see, is the monster dump trucks monster playing card he has a hit point or life of seven he is strong he is slow and he uses sonic location to find out uh where his target is and this cute adorable darth vader will be sir anchovy the putrid so this is sir anchovy the putrid's monster card you can see from his card that he is clever he attacks using riddles so the end of this will be a battle of wits and he loves to make a deal he also has the ability to see very far away and then as you can see through here these are my cast of non-playing characters npcs that i can grab as i need So here are uh, Gwellum and Equestra enjoying their morning coffee at Moonbucks, discussing and chilling and planning their retirement, as Equestra told you earlier. Then in comes Miss Grumpus. Ah, everybody, no way. You are not going to believe this, Sir Putrid, the Sir Anchovy. The putrid, I'm so verklempt I can't even talk straight, has kidnapped all the unicorns in the forest and has them locked up in an invisible magic paddock. What are we going to do? Oh, no! And this is where... Ah! So worried that he falls off his stool. Equestra, what are we going to do? Kresha is thinking very contemplatively as the cat unicorn does. All of a sudden, Gwellum gets, the, gets an idea. We got this. No worries. Let's go to your stable and collect our supplies so we can go save the unicorns. At this point, as the game master, I would just approve the automatic travel to the stables to collect supplies. 
Um, there's not really much g information gathering that's happening at that point. If you wanted them to run into an NPC and have a conversation, maybe some more clues, you could definitely do that at this point. Um, and in that case, you would want to roll. Because then they have to decide if they're going to talk to the NPC, if they're going to ignore the NPC, all of that. Um, so at this point, they're automatically traveling to the stable and collecting their belongings. Okay, so before we can start moving, we have to decide which direction we're going to get to Sir Anchovy. There are two ways, one by the Saucy River and one by the Mushroom Forest. So let's roll and decide which way we're going. We can use a uh, 1d6 to decide. If it is above three, we go to the Mushroom Forest. It's a four! Mushroom Forest, here we come! As the two heroes, that would be me and Gwillem, head out toward the Mushroom Forest, Gwillem begins to sing a beautiful traveling song, Who Let the Unicorns Out? You, know, you, you probably knew it. Who let the unicorns out? Da, 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 da. I sing it so much better than Gwellum does. But I had to really keep, keep up at an oddly quick pace. With Gwellum lost in her song and me lost in determination, we failed to notice the young Lego archer following us. It was easy to miss his footsteps with Gwellum's melodic expressions. The Lego archer was bounding from tree to tree trying to stay unnoticed. He was successful until Gwillem stopped singing and asked me a question. And then we heard a branch snap. We slowly turned around to face the Lego archer. Ah, uh, who are you and what are you doing? Asked Willem. Ah, no worries, mates. I was in Moonbucks and overheard your plans to rescue the unicorns. I'm just following to see if I can be of any corn. <gasps> you want to catch what? I exclaimed. You know unicorns are not meant to be captive. It'll destroy their magic. Well, the Lego archer took a half step back, surprised by my intensity, but persists. They're so cute and cuddly. I just have to have one. I gotta have a unicorn. I need to decide what next. Do I talk to the archer? Do I fight the archer? Or do I try to work with the archer and stop him later? So now the traveling must begin. We have our dice, we have our minis, we have our map. So we need to move, if you remember correctly, to move 1d4 and Equestra gets a 1d6. So we need to make sure we have both of those dice handy. So I'm going to roll Gwellum's move first. So, Gwellum gets to move three from the stables. One, one, two, three. G. Then Equestra gets to move four. One, two, three, and four. Okay, so at this point, they can choose to keep moving, which I think they probably should. Um... And they can, as they're rolling, the Game Master can pretend uh, conversations where Gwellum is, Equestra, wait up, you're going too fast. I don't like it when you don't wait for me. Haha, -ha, I will take you over now because I can move four spaces. One, sorry, one, two, three, four. Oops, sorry. One, two, three, four. G. Well, Gwellum, you just need to be patient because I've got five. 
One, two, three, four, and five. So as Equestra and Gwillem are moving through the forest, they're getting closer to their uh, archer. What are they going to do? Do to do, do to do. Do to do to do, do do. So they're moving along. Actually, it should, Gwellum should be back there. Alrighty, let's move again. Gwellum goes first. I'm going to move my rolling station there. Three. One, two, three. Equestra. Where's my six-sided? Four. One, two. Sorry. One, two, three, four. Equestra. Equestra, you never wait for me. I know you need to get to your unicorns, but come on. <gasps> Quiet, Well, I'm, I'm hearing something. I am hearing something and I'm not liking it. Equestra, you just want me to stop singing. La 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 la. Well, I said quiet. Okay. So while they're waiting to decide, or while Frank, the archer, is waiting to decide. Hear the decision of the two fearless heroes. Never mind, they were a little startled when Frank jumped from the trees. Uh, they have a couple of options. Their options are to... So Gwellum and Equestria are slowly discussing this archer's fate. In order to make their decision, they will be using a 12-sided die. Their options are, if they roll a 1 through a 4, they will continue to talk to the archer. If they roll a 5 through an 8, they will fight the archer so that he can no longer follow them, hopefully. And if he rolls a 9 through a 12, they will allow the archer to join their team and then hopefully talk him out of kidnapping a baby unicorn. So let's roll... Maybe. We roll an 11! Yes! He gets to join the team, so we have extra set of hands, and it gives us an opportunity to talk him out of his poor decision-making and selfish behavior with wild animals. So we find out that the archer's name is Frank. In order, he has a, we rolled for a hit point of eight, or his life is eight, to move. He rolls a 1d4, and to hit, he rolls a 1d8. His weapon is an arrow with a range of 20 inches or blocks. Now, if you remember, Frank and Equestra can work together because she can cast an, a uh, spell called Accurate Arrow. So as they work together, as we get closer to the Mushroom Forest... That becomes important. So, as the two heroes, that would be me and Gwillem, continue with our tag-along friend, through the woods, we follow a trail that is continually getting damper with every step, and we hear a low rumble. The rumble is so low we could feel it in our chests. It was steadily growing louder and closer and soon the ground was vibrating and there was a sudden earthy smell emanating from in front of us. Ew! What's that stank? The Lego Archer asks with disgust. I'm not going that way, he protests. Fine, stay here. Let us know when you meet the rumbling monster we can't see yet, Gwillem offers flatly without missing a step down the murky path. Gwillem wonders aloud, 
What in garlic could that be? I've never heard anything that low before. Equestra, I think we are in trouble. You think? Quick, check your map. Are we getting closer to the mushroom forest? A horde of dump trucks is trying to get to the mushroom forest and clear it for the pizza cult. Do we attack the trucks? Do we evade the trucks and move forward? Or do we ask to speak to the lead dump truck? So now the three heroes, well, okay, two heroes and one questionable character are setting out closer to Mushroom Forest. And they hear this low, almost a bark or rumble sound coming as they go. Now remember, as they're walking, things get grosser and damper and wetter as they get close to the Mushroom Forest. Alrighty, at this point, you know how to use your map. You know how to use your dice. And you know how to interact with characters. So what we're going to do now is I'm not going to play out the whole journey to Mushroom Forest. I'm going to let you imagine that in your own living rooms. And we're going to get to the dump trucks and show you a battle or a, a conflict that um, can happen. And once we play that out, I think you're ready to go and freelance on your own. I think this will be so exciting. Alrighty, so now to the dump trucks. As you remember, our ever so scary panda dump trucks have a life of seven. They are strong, they are slow, and they have sonic location. As our heroes are walking towards the uh, mushroom forest, you'll remember they're hearing this low rumble. That is how our dump trucks are locating both the forest and our heroes. So, let's say our heroes are getting close and are ready to interact with the dump trucks. So here's our map. As you can see, Frank, our archer, has moved up. He has a range of 20 inches or blocks. Equestra is our magic user. She typically has a range of 20 unless she's healing. Then it's unlimited. And Gwellum, our fearless sword fighter, only has a range of one inch or block. So it's a good thing he's close because otherwise he'd be useless. Um, so that's how we have progressed, and we are interacting with the dump trucks. We have three choices here. So again, I'm grabbing my 12-sided die because we have three choices. We can attack the trucks. I don't know, they're kind of big and burly. We can evade the trucks, which means completely ignore them and move forward. Or we can ask to speak to the lead dump truck and see if we can... Uh, talk some sense into them. So again, one through four is attack. Five through eight is evade. And nine through 12 is speak to the lead dump truck. So here we go. We rolled another 11. Woohoo! So we are going to talk to the lead dump truck. So now we have to decide who goes to talk to them? Is it Equestria the Charming, Fairy, Sweet and Cunning, our questionable character who we don't know if we can trust yet? Or Gwilym the Tone Deaf and Slightly um, Clueless? So let's roll. We got a four! So Equestria will be going to speak to the big bad dump trucks excuse me mr dump truck mr dump truck Brrr. now listen here i need you to stop going after the mushroom forest you cannot do that or i will get you with my horn Brrr. 
I would rather not fight. I need you to listen to reason so that we can save the habitat. If you destroy the mushroom forest, the caterpillars, the butterflies, the griffins, and the unicorns will all suffer. <sighs> You're not stopping. I do not wish to fight you, but if you do not listen, you leave me no choice. So now, what do you think the best plan would be? I think Frank should fire an arrow, or first of all, Equestria should cast um, Accurate Arrow to Frank and let Frank shoot. So, what we do to cast Accurate Arrow, this is where, this is where the Game Master can kind of make up some rules. Um, accurate Arrow, as you can see, uh, on the Archer, guarantees the Archer's next attack will hit. Last one turn, range is 20 inches or blocks. Um, the Game Master can say you need to roll to see if Accurate Arrow, the casting of that spell actually hits your archer. So, we are going to grab the six-sided dice. Equestria is going to cast Accurate Arrow if she hits. In order to hit, she needs to roll higher than a three. She rolled a three. She failed to hit. No! So the archer now, Frank, has to shoot his arrow because he is in within... One, two, three, four, five, six blocks of the trucks. So he can roll his 1d8. So Gwilym's going to roll. He shot his arrow. Let's see how much damage he's done. He's done a glancing blow. Of so with Frank's hit, the monster goes down to a life point or hit point of five. Okay, now the monster gets to uh, roll some attacks back. So, right now, my monster here is going to attack Equestra because Equestra is the biggest threat right now. So, he's rolling his damage. He goes to two. So, Equestra, the magic user, quickly goes down. Two, three points. Okay. No, now things are picking up. Gwellum gets to go. Now remember, every move has the ability for a player to move and attack. So, we're at Gwellum. Gwellum rolls a 1d4 for his moving. He rolls a 3. So he gets 1, 2, 3. So now Gwellum is right here. Now he can attack. Gwellum rolls a 1d8 to attack the monster. And the monster's life is down to 5. So he could wipe the, the dump truck out. <gasps> he rolls a 4. So the dump trucks are down to 1. Wow, this is getting exciting. Alrighty. So now... Frank needs to move. And in order to move, Frank rolls the 1d4. He's not a slow mover. And so we get one. Not real helpful, Frank. But we're getting there. Remember, he's an archer. And he's going to attack. All he needs is to roll a one. And we can continue on our quest. <gasps> He hits a seven, yes! And the monster, the dump trucks, are no longer a threat. They have run away back to their habitats. So now we're gonna talk about how to fight battles with riddles instead of weapons. This is often a good way to change things up and if you're family or table don't want to have combat, then this is definitely the answer. And Sir Anchovy says, I will 
attack you with a riddle. This is a battle of wits, and you must win. Now, understand that Sir Anchovy is being played and managed by the Game Master. Uh, so everything that Sir Anchovy does is up to the Game Master, okay? Um, so, Anchovy throws out a riddle. And the riddle is, what has a golden head, a golden tail, but no body? Haha, <laughs> you bet you can't figure this out. What is he talking about? Golden head, golden body. Or golden head, golden tail, no body. That makes no sense. What is it, golden chicken? You are wrong. Ha 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 ha. Now we will roll to see how much damage you incur. Four points of damage. So, Gwellum, that takes you to three. No! No! But I, we will be back. We are not done. This battle of wits is not over. Another, another use for NPCs, as this guy is here, is your playing characters could meet them along the road. And they could have information or skills or money or items to give your party your campaign party but maybe you have to solve a riddle so in this case uh this npc's riddle would be what dampens as it dries and if you can answer me correctly i will give you 20 silver pieces and the sketchy archer could answer, what dampens as it dries? That's easy, mate. That's a towel. Dag nabbit! How dare you get that right? Here are your 20 pieces and never speak to me again. So as you can see, I've stolen uh, Equestria's Minnie's Unicorn Horn. Because um, at this point in the game, we have talked about how to battle with riddles and how riddles can be used. The... In doing that segment, I realized that one of the things I didn't highlight um, because I wanted to get mechanics down is for the game master to make the journey more exciting is a way to run into the NPCs. Um, have a, you know, someone they run into on the road or they turn a corner and there's a broken down carriage and they have to decide whether or not um, to help. And if they help, uh, do they get anything from them? Do they earn any equipment or money or skills? So there's, or knowledge. Knowledge is a big thing in a D&D world. So make those interactions throughout your game, not just at the monster or the baddies where you're battling or having to confront people. You can have interactions throughout the game with NPCs. And it's a great way to try out ideas, uh, practice riddle use. Another thing that I know uh, friends of mine and I do, or friends of mine do, is they're very musical. And so at an interaction where you would put a riddle, they may say, you know, give you their um, a musical riddle, or you have to be able to play this chord or this tune or something along those lines in order to answer the question. So anything is fair game. Have fun with it. Create. Riddles are just the beginning. Okay, so now we're getting close to the end. Um, and this is where I want to just thank everyone. I'm hoping that this generated some understanding, obviously, and then some ideas of how we can bring this to life in our living rooms, in our backyards. This is not a once and done kind of thing. Um, it's a great idea to maybe play monthly and let people develop character ideas and whatnot as the month goes on. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to make sure that everyone understands the resources that Miss Rita and I have put in the comment section of this video. These resources are important. The basis for this entire video is from a article that we stumbled upon called DMing for your toddler. 
Um, it's by Cory Doctorow, and it's from issue one of Gygax magazine. Um, so it's written uh, from the point of view of a father trying to get his daughter into playing Dungeons and Dragons. There's also um, videos from experts, gaming experts, which Miss Reed and I are not gaming experts, um, on how to properly uh, be a game master for a table of kids uh, as you get into more traditional RPGs. There's also a link to riddles so that you can uh, have a wealth of riddles to use throughout your games. Um, so there's all kinds of resources. In the library, we also have resources, we have books, we have a series for player manual, uh, dungeon master manual, and monster manual. And then we also have um, DMing for dummies, or Dungeons and Dragons for dummies. And these are also great resources to start a traditional Dungeons and Dragons game. Uh, Miss Reed and I want to see this grow. Uh, we'll have more videos in the future of maybe a video just creating a character sheet for a traditional Dungeons & Dragons game. And then we'll continue that as we go. Uh, the big picture is we would like to have a Dungeons & Dragons group that meets at the library once a month, maybe once every other month, to do a campaign. But that's down the road. I want to thank everyone for joining us. I want everyone to start rolling that die and creating those worlds. And uh, let us know if you have any questions. Thank you, and we'll see you in the library.